Alright guys, I'm back. I'm here with Team64, my good buddy. So you Hello have everyone. <laughs> you have to forgive me, this is, I haven't really done many interviews, so forgive me for the terrible interview quality. Um, but yeah, Tim, why don't you int introduce yourself, a bit about your poker story and who you are. Well, um, thanks for inviting me. Um, at the moment, I've got two images of me on the screen, so I'm hoping that's the software, not that I've just had too much to drink. Um, so, yeah, I'm a, a pro. I've been playing for six years now, um, but about five of those as a professional. Um, and I've been playing various different formats of things, but after flitting back and forth a while, I settled on sit and goes. Um, and I guess that's how we kind of got to know each other because we were both haunting the same for forums on pokerstrategy.com. Yep. And um, yeah, just sort of been fighting the good fight through all the trials and tribulations and uh, yeah, still here plugging away. That's cool. So let's start from the start. So yeah, you, you had a job before poker? Yeah, um, I was a lawyer, um, I guess, yeah, over 10 years ago now. Um, working in the city in London and uh, it was quite stressful kind of lifestyle uh, not very much sort of certainty about what your hours were going to be and um, although the money was really good it was kind of uh, not great for my mental health I guess you could say it was kind of stress so yep. um, we, my wife and I went on a very long honeymoon traveling around the world and um, I was trying to think of things that we could do on all those long bus rides and stuff, um, waiting for various inefficient modes of transport. And um, I came up with the, you know, the idea of just taking a pack of cards and we took the rules to some games. And so we were just playing a little bit of poker. I don't know, it probably was some of the worst poker ever played, ever. <laughs> um, uh, just playing for matchsticks and stuff. Um, but I think that must have kind of just set something off in my head so when I got back when we got back from traveling we were away for a year um, I was just kind of I had a lot of time on my hands and bumming around the internet uh, as you do just free online poker and then was trying to get into the strategy of it and then I found the poker strategy and got the free bankroll and yep. you know as that was all she wrote really <laughs> and here we are cool yeah exactly so I mean I know that you've moved around between different games but you started with sit and goes is that correct? Yeah, well I started, uh, I guess the first $25 I earned were playing uh, short stack strategy cash games, you know, 20 big blinds. <laughs> yep. So, um, uh, and then I guess fairly, I, I think I got up to No Limit 100 with 20 big blind stacks playing cash games and then obviously you know, hit the inevitable downswing where I realized that actually I didn't knew, know how to do anything except, you know, three bet shove, ace jack and stuff like that. And so then I kind of got into sit and goes and played sit and goes for a while, you know, just as a kind of hobby, just trying to make some pocket money and started to get a bit more serious. Um, and then eventually I kind of reached the point where, you know, I was earning about the same as what I was doing my day job, which was a call center job. Yep. Um, and yeah, just sort of made the switch, made made the decision to go pro, and yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So um, you obviously started out with poker strategy, learning the strategies there, and eventually you got to the point where uh, you were a coach and helping out people on the forums and starting to make videos. So what was that like? Well, I, I have I have you to thank actually for that because uh, you think you. When I was trying to get into the coaching gig, I uh, you were already coached there, so I was I got you to put in a good word, and you had a lot of uh, sway, you you know, because of your reputation. So they just kind of went, oh well, if you know, if lesson three says he's okay, he must be okay. So they they gave me the nod. Um, yeah, I mean, it took a long time to get um, like established as a video producer. That's actually only been relatively recently. Um, there was um, a much more competition then in, in terms of video producers than is, there is now and um, you know so I had to kind of wait until some of the more established names went off and did other things or got fired or whatever so yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Um, I mean, they've had they've had so many guys there, um, and and I think their policy changed as well to one of you know trying to maybe have some more homegrown names rather than just the big names. Um, so yeah, and uh, and again, even with sort of private coaching, that was something I moved into relatively late on. Um, that's only been really the last, I guess, two and a half, three years. Um, so just trying to, I guess, gradually diversify a bit more. You know, mm -hmm. I think with well, and you found this if you're just grinding day in, day out, playing poker, it uh, eventually reaches the point where it begins to take its toll. So I think trying to do some other things which are kind of related to poker but maybe not directly playing it sort of helps with that you know long longevity there yeah for sure so in terms of sit and goes um let's just talk about your sit and go career a bit mm. the type of sit and goes that you started playing and then what you're now playing now let's just go through the the evolution of it sure well i guess i started with nine mans like you um started on full tour poker um and uh, sort of grinding up. I go up to, I think, the $36 uh, limit on full tilt poker, and I hit a really big downswing, um, or rather just, you know, running a long way under EV. And I have kind of went to cash for six months, felt like a traitor, so eventually I came back. When I came back, I, I um, was just trying to look for anything else to do, um, you know, because I was just so fed up with uh, with poker at that stage. So I was just messing around, played some six max sit and goes, and because I'd been playing six max cash before that, the the six max format really felt much more natural to me. So I basically restarted sit and goes, playing almost exclusively six max, and just grinded up through the limits. Um, and then after Black Friday hit, uh, I, I noticed that today is the four year anniversary of Black. Friday, which makes me feel like even older than I yeah. actually am. <laughs> um, but yeah, after Black Friday and Full Tilt going under, I had to go to Party Poker because of you know volume being what it was. I was ending up playing like you know many more variants, so some nine mans, some fifty fifties, um, other sort of things, and then eventually found my way to Poker Stars and back to more or less exclusively six max until relatively recently. Yeah. So yeah. So now you're playing spinning goes, is that right? Yeah, most of most of the time I'm I'm grinding spinning goes. I I still try and fit in the occasional six max, um, but the spinning goes have definitely taken a lot of a lot of traffic away from sit and goes in general. So it's kind of, um, you know, uh, if you can't beat him, join him type uh, rationale. So yeah. And what's your opinion of the spinning goes? Do you do you like them? Do you you know do you think that they're bad for poker? What do you think? Well, I definitely don't think that they're as bad as um, the initial reaction from most of the pros would would have you believe. I mean, I think the initial feeling was, wow, this is just pure gambling. Um, it's, it's just too much variance. No one's going to be able to make a living. You know, this is kind of the end of sit-and-go poker. And I think it definitely hasn't, you know, been the case. And people are showing that you can make a profit in them. So, you know, for me, wanting to play the kind of binds that, I play and getting games which are still, you know, still beatable. I can still have some sort of perceptible edge. Um, they're a pretty decent choice. They also allow you to get pretty good volume in because they're just over in a few minutes. So, yep. as someone who's had, you know, a lot of trouble <laughs> putting in the hours, kind of a lazy boy poker uh, wise, they're, they're they're a decent option. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so you've also dabbled a little bit in the staking side of poker. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, let's talk okay. about that yeah, for a sorry. bit. Yeah. Um, well, staking again was one of these things that I kind of discovered fairly late on, and I was kicking myself for a long time, just thinking, "Wow, why didn't I get into this um, earlier?" Um, but it's not without its hassles. I mean, you know, both in terms of the uncertainty about whether uh, the players that you're staking are going to do well, but also just the administrative hassle. Um, and you know there there are sort of there are, there are pros and cons, but I mean it has been um, a good thing, and I've been profitable at, at it. I think the best thing is actually just again going back to what I was saying earlier. It just gives you another look 
um, another look at the game. You're, you're seeing it through other people's eyes. You're looking at the challenges that they're having to go through. And um, that's that helps you kind of see the game in another perspective. And I think it helps with your own uh, approach. It's just to realize that everyone's going through these tough times when you play poker and just ups and downs. And so I guess seeing that, seeing other people go through that helps me with my game. And then on the flip side, having been through some of these big down swings myself, I've been able to help people get through them. And that's, yeah, that gives me a lot of, well, I don't like to say it, but sort of job satisfaction, if you if you know what I mean. I'm mm. um, just getting people through their down swings, getting them up up the limits. And um, yeah, that's that's been good, positive experience. Um, yeah, I mean, spin and goes and just general contraction of the market has meant that staking has kind of fallen off a bit, but I've still got a few um, geniuses um, out there wor working hard for me, doing their best. So yeah. yeah, that's good. Do you have any um any stories from that? You know, any bad eggs that have run off with yeah, your money? Yeah, a couple. I mean, not not as many as I thought. I mean, you know, Pete, when I said I was going to try and get into staking, everyone was like, "Oh, you can't do this. Everyone's just trying to rip you off. Um, you you just you know you're going to get uh, messed around with so much." I've had I think about maybe two players, probably out of fifty stakies, maybe two or three that actually just kind of tried to run off with money. Mm -hmm. um, in each case, it was just, it was hundreds of dollars rather than thousands of dollars. Um, and it was kind of dwarfed by the number of just good, reliable, honest stakies that I had. So I've been fairly kind of, I don't know whether you want to call it anal or careful, one of the two, uh, about you know the guys that I stake, trying to make sure that they've got good records and uh, you know having a kind of proper contract which you sort of sit down and go through them so you know what's expected of both parties um, so the legal but the legal background help with that um, probably makes their life a nightmare as I'm constantly making them you know sign contracts and stuff but I think it's kind of good if you know exactly what you know you're meant to be doing and you know what you know what uh, what's been agreed will happen if you know you're not putting in the volume or if you know whatever so yeah well it sounds like you, you've got the right um way to do it because uh, there, yeah there's a, certainly a right and a wrong way to do staking and it sounds like with all your record keeping and um yeah analness i think it's working out for you so that's good <laughs> yeah um so what do you see for the future of sit and goes do you think that it's uh there's going to be another boom do you think that you know there's going to be a downturn what do, what do you see in the future well, I've been waiting for that, the boom, um, ever since, you know, Black Friday, and everyone said, okay, well, we're just waiting for Amer America to get its um, legalization of poker up and running, and then it will be like the good times again. And I think enough time has gone past since Black Friday to realize that that's probably not going to happen and if it does happen it's going to be a long way down the line I mean I think what the US really wants to do is just have its own poker market and just keep the money flowing around um, in its own jurisdiction so that it can tax it in the way it uh, you know, sees fit so I don't really see that market ever coming back and I guess that probably means that there's not going to be a big poker boom anytime soon um, they've got some big you know public names playing poker these days but I don't think that's going to sort of you know, suddenly make everyone want to take it up. But that said, I, I also don't think that it's going to have a big downturn. I mean, it seems like a fairly resilient industry in that, you know, you, you've the big sites went down and everyone thought that was the end of online poker and it's come back. And the games have changed and the regs have got better. Um, and they're giving the recreational players, you know, a really tough time, but still, you know, there's money to be made in the game, and, you know, they keep um, trying to bring out new formats to keep things interesting, and I think, generally, by and large, they're doing a good job of that, so if you're willing to change and adapt as a player and not sort of stick your head in the sand and say, well, the games that I was playing are no longer available, so, you know, life is over, I think if you're willing to change, then for the foreseeable for the foreseeable future at least um, yeah we should be uh, should be in business fingers crossed yeah it's an important part of poker um, being able to adapt to the environment and you know trying to get value out of 
many different parts of uh, the game. And that's what I really admire about you is that you've not only um, become a very strong player, but you also have a very strong business side of poker in coaching and in staking. And that's, you know, that's really something to be proud of. So um, let's just talk a little bit about your specific play style and actually how you approach the game. So how many tables do you play? Do you use software? Um, you know, what's your, if you're coaching new people, what's your recommendation for new players? Just go through a bit of those, those things for me, if you could. Okay. Um, well, number of tables I play depends on what I'm playing. Um, I've always been, um, like I said earlier, sort of quite a low volume grinder. So my focus is always on pushing my edge as far as possible at the expense of volume. So that means, you know, I'm not playing 20 tables. Um, I When I was playing six max games, I was usually having about six or seven tables up. So pretty low number of tables compared with other, you know, um, professionals. Um, I guess part of that is just not liking variance too much and wanting to have a fairly kind of smooth curve on my graph. Mm -hmm. um, not wanting to... I mean, the other thing is, is having a family and that sort of need to have you know, fairly steady earnings without too much swinginess. Um, that's probably influenced my style. So, yeah, not more than six tables. And with the spin and goes, it's probably more like three or four, depending on which buy-ins are running. Um, you're involved in pretty much every other hand, at least in a spin and go. So you, you can't... I don't know. I mean, you, there are some people who are you know, playing ridiculous numbers of tables, but they're just better at it than me, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, in terms of software, I use Table Ninja um, to sort of automate my bet sizing and put the tables in a kind of orderly grid. Um, I have Holder Manager running so that I can review hands, mark hands and review them later, and obviously to produce a heads-up display. Um, I think that's pretty much... Um, everything in terms of software. I use some ICM uh, calculating software, which is the Holden Resources um, downloadable uh, calculator. So and that's pretty much it, I think. All right, so while we're on the, the topic of Holden Resources calculators, what's your study routine like? Are you uh, doing a warm-up session each day? Are you doing a cool-down? Uh, you know, let's talk about ratio of, of study to play and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, these days I probably don't study as much as I should do. I certainly don't study as much as I did do. Um, I don't know, probably like most players, my I study more when things are not going well. Um, so usually if I hit some big downswing and I feel I'm playing badly, that will, that will spur me on to study more. And if, if I'm in a kind of studying phase, it'll maybe be even half and half. Um, but if things are going well and um, you know my the the graph is going up, then I I guess it's mostly playing and coaching and a little bit of staking stuff and just it's more a, a case of if I've got a a push or fold spot that I I'm not sure about I'll mark it and you know just check my marked hands at the end of the day or beginning of the next day um, or if it's like a post flop spot I'll usually mark it and just be thinking about it, you know, over the next few hours, just be mentally going back to the hand and thinking, okay, maybe I could have played it differently. What about my opponent did, you know, did what he he uh, played make se made sense or whatever, and then just sort of review the hand. So it's not that structured, to be honest. It's more just kind of, okay, yeah, there's that hand that I must remember to check. Cool. Um, I think I've come to the end of my brain's uh, thoughts. Um, do you have anything else, Tim, that you'd like to add about your career or um, yeah, anything in general about teaching people how to get into sit and goes? Because the stream is mostly about teaching new players how to build up a mm. bankroll. I mean, you've, you've done it before, so any advice about how to grind out those early stages and, and get into it at the mid-stakes, really? Yeah, I mean... I definitely think patience is is a virtue in in this in this kind of field where it's it's really tempting to just move up as soon as you can you know as soon as you've got the bankroll to do it and 
there are there are lots of stories who did of people who did just kind of shoot up through the limits. Um, but I think they're relatively few and far between. And if you if you're willing to be patient and sort of you know make sure you've got the fundamentals down before you move up, make sure your bankroll is healthy, that's going to reduce the chance of you having to move back down. And I always found that I mean I've had to move between limits like everyone else, but you know if you move down, that can be demoralizing. So definitely be patient. Make sure that your game is you know your fundamentals are good before you move up. Um, I mean, I think sit and goes still remain a good way of building bankrolls. Um, they they have the advantage that you can put in good volume. You can structure your poker day in terms of you know a set of games or I'm going to play for an hour. Cash games, you know, I'm sure they're just as good in terms of actual ability to make money. But you know, what I always found with playing cash games was, you know, if I was stuck. I would always want to play, you know, one more hand. It's just okay. I'm just going to play a few more hands, see if I can get even. And I never did get even when I was stuck. I just lost more. So whereas sit and go, as you say, okay, I'm going to play for an hour. I'm going to put in my 50 gains, and then I'm just drawing a line under the day. So I think they are still a good way for players to build bankrolls. And fortunately, at the low limits where these, you know, people are building their starter bankrolls, the games are still beatable. And we saw, you know, in the games, a couple of hypers that you were playing today mm. <laughs> some of the things that people are doing i mean you know they're just sort of unbelievable really so if you've got that first 50 to 100 dollars to put online and you just follow some fairly simple strategy you definitely can build a bankroll so it's uh, it's really nice actually to see guys on on twitch showing how you you can actually go about doing it so hopefully we'll have some followers with some success stories in the near future. Yeah, hopefully. So I've got some questions from the chat here. Uh, Bastola says, what kind of requirements does someone need to have to be staked in the game? So what would you look for in if you were going to stake someone? Would it be personality or would it be ability? Um, I, I guess ability would come first. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably no fun to work with someone with a lousy personality, but you know, if they're um, <laughs> if they're crushing the game, you you would always uh, you know mm. probably look the other way. So I guess what what I what I look for is if someone contacts me, the first thing I look for is you know have they got a sample of games? You know, have I look on Sharkscope and I say, okay, has this guy played a reasonable number of sit and goes, or are they just literally beginning? If they've got a sample and it's a losing sample, then I'm usually saying, okay, you're not beating the game, so I can't stake you. If they're beating the game, then that's when I sort of, you know, would get interested. So it's someone who's put in, you know, 500, 1K games, has a winning sample, but, you know, either maybe they had to withdraw or they want help getting to the next limit or something like that. Um, so other people might, you know, take more of a gamble if someone's sort of break even and they think they can turn them into a winning player. Um, there's always a trade-off because with most players you can improve them you can turn them from break even into winning or from losing into break even but you're trading off how many hours of coaching you have to invest to get them to that point you know compared with let's say what profit you're expecting them to bring in so yep. definitely w winning players um, are kind of what you're looking for uh, first and foremost great thanks that's a good answer so another question from Mike Murphy what kind of bankroll is needed for one dollar spinning goes Okay, so um, what I've been telling people for spin and goes was for the micros, I would say have 100 buy-ins. And the reality is if you're playing $1 spin and goes, you're not going to be making a living from it and you're not going to be playing them to make a living. So if you go busto, it's usually not the end of the world. Um, if I were playing a limit professionally, I really would want 200 buy-ins minimum because I've been playing them for a while now and I have had 100 buy and downswings myself so if that's your entire bankroll gone that's kind of bad so yeah for the micros where you can have a big edge um, and you're likely to maybe not get hit by variance so hard I would say 100 buy ins say for anything else or for anyone semi-professional you really want 150 to 200 buy-ins plus. And even that is no kind of guarantee that you're not going to get a bad downswing, but just makes it a little bit less likely. They're, they're certainly a swingier game than you know, your average sit and go. So yeah, definitely. You need, to, you, need a, you need a nice buffer there. All right, I think we've got one last question here from 
uh, a student of yours, V Pre Music, he says, What games do you find easier to play? Nine man or six man singos? Um well thanks for thanks for turning up, Vedran. Um nine mans or six man? I mean six mans for me, just because it's um it's a format where your average opponent is looser and that means you get to play more hands. Anytime you get to play more hands, you're gonna see more flops. And since as a professional your edge is biggest, um, post flop, that just kinda translates into more opportunities to use that edge. So nine mans there are much tighter um starting hand requirements from many positions, which means you just get less post flop spots. So that's why I mean you can definitely usually play a lot more nine man tables and you can six max because you're involved in less hands on average so for me six max is is an easier format just and a, a little bit more enjoyable for me as well just because i'm kind of loosey-goosey and want to get involved in lots of uh, lots of pots with the fun players yeah great i agree i really love six max uh, yeah. for that for the a extra action um all right tim so i think we're coming to an end um if you have any shout outs uh maybe plug all your stuff now's the time to do it yeah, I mean, um, I, I got a, uh, I've had a website up for a while, but it's recently had a, um, a revamp. So um, that's www.onthestoop.co.uk. Um, that's my uh, username on all the web on the poker sites I play on is on the stoop. Um, I'm even gonna hey, you've you've put it there in the chat. Thank you. So um, really happy with the site. There's a you know links to coaching, uh, scheduling. Um, gives a bit about my background, shows my results and stuff. So that's hopefully I'm going to work out well. And uh, yeah, you can follow me on all sorts of different social media. I, I go through phases of like being really chatty and tweeting a lot about ridiculous things. And then I'll have a, a period when I'm a little bit quieter. So you have to kind of hang around for the good stuff. But um, yeah, so take a look at the website if you can. And if you want some help with your game, give me a shout. I'd be glad to help. Great. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Tim, for the interview. That was really great. Um, it was good to talk to you again. Yeah, you too. Thanks very much for asking me along. And uh, yeah, it's uh, really good, like I said, to see all these channels popping up. And uh, I shall now that I've seen you in action, I shall be uh, I shall be uh, catching up. Maybe maybe not staying up past midnight every night every night, but uh, definitely watching the reruns. Great. Look, looking forward to seeing you in the in the chat. Okay, champ. All right. See you, mate. Have a good sleep. Yeah, too.